I'm David Brown, Director of the Virginia Department of Health Professions. Welcome to Virginia's core competency modules for pain management and addiction. These competencies were developed by work groups convened by Virginia's Secretary of Health. Over two dozen experts in pain management and addiction compiled the essential competencies that Virginia's health professional students must acquire, not just our future physicians, nurses, dentists, and pharmacists, but the wide range of professionals who work with these types of patients. These modules, made possible by a Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services grant, present key parts of the competencies for use not only by our schools, but by, by practitioners already in the field. Thank you for your careful attention to this important information. Hi, my name is Chathan Bacharetti, and I'm an assistant professor at VCU School of Medicine and the Chief Medical Officer of Medicaid for the Commonwealth of Virginia. In the prior session, we learned that addiction is a complex, multifaceted disease that affects brain function and behavior. Over the next module, we'll provide an overview of the treatment of addiction, including the principles of effective care, medication-assisted treatment, how and when to refer to specialty addiction care. And we'll end with evidence-based treatment models. So let's start at the beginning. The treatment of addiction has a long and at times tumultuous history. The contributors to addiction and its treatment cannot be separated from society and our moment in time. For example, today we define opioid use disorder as a chronic relapsing disease, a bio, psycho, social, spiritual illness. But throughout much of the 1900s, and even today, many individuals think of addiction as a moral failing rather than a chronic relapsing disease. And so they use terms like addict or user to refer to someone with opioid use disorder. Mutual help groups were some of the first attempts at treat treatment for individuals with addiction and date as far back as the 17 and 1800s. Probably the most popular group today is Alcoholics Anonymous, a treatment program started in 1935 by Bill Wilson and Bob Smith in Akron, Ohio. Their program of spiritual awakening and recovery facilitated by the structure of the 12 steps and support from regular group meetings has spread across the globe uh, and spurred a number of spin-off programs, including Narcotics Anonymous. They are one of many mutual help groups now and for some patients can be life-changing. Maintenance pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder dates as far back as the early 1900s when patients with addiction to opioids were treated with heroin maintenance therapy with reasonable success. However, there was significant stigma attached to this treatment of using heroin maintenance therapy, and it was thought of as replacing one addiction with another. Law enforcement clamped down. Between 1919 and 1935, almost 25,000 physicians were indicted, and 10% were imprisoned for uh, treating patients with heroin maintenance therapy. A practice that originated in the United States is now outlawed, but continues legally and successfully in many European countries today. Without the benefit of maintenance pharmacotherapy, throughout the, the mid-1900s, painful de detoxification from opioids was seen as the most effective treatment option for achieving recovery. This ideal fell far short of reality, and the vast majority of those who detoxified quickly relapsed to opioid use, often with deadly consequences. In the late 1960s and 1970s, veterans returning from the Vietnam War uh, who were newly addicted uh, to heroin, along with an increasing supply of cheap heroin, spurred a heroin epidemic that led President Nixon to launch the War on Drugs. It's important to note a few things about the federal government's response in Nixon's War on Drugs. First, methadone had been discovered uh, as a um, opioid agonist therapy and we'll discuss, uh, Dr. LeMay will discuss this uh, in further detail in the next uh, module. So methadone had been discovered, um, was found to be very effective for people addicted to opioids, and was actually a key uh, part of Nixon's strategy. He developed federal treatment programs called opioid treatment programs that focused on discipline and compliance. And we'll talk more about 
these opioid treatment programs uh, later on in this module. The second thing to note is that the war on drugs also facilitated increased legal penalties for substance use and has directly contributed to the mass incarceration epidemic we see today in the United States' unenviable position as the most carceral state in the world. So today, we face another opioid crisis. For the third year in a row, life expectancy has declined, particularly among middle-aged white Americans. From 2000 to 2017, deaths from suicide and unintentional overdose rose from 41,000 to over 110,000. To put these grim statistics in context, life expectancy has not declined so consistently since the great influenza pandemic of 1918. All groups have been adversely affected, and African Americans continue to suffer from shorter life expectancies compared to white Americans. However, the trends in life expectancy for the entire demographic of middle-aged white Americans is alarming, especially when one considers that in other high-income countries, middle-aged white Americans are actually continuing to experience increases in life expectancy. It is thought that these deaths are intimately related to social and economic factors, including wage stagnation for low and middle income households, increasing social isolation, and overall lack of opportunity. Virginia has not been spared. As you can see from this chart, our prescription opioid epidemic turned into a heroin epidemic and worsened in recent years with the introduction of fentanyl leading to more and more death and suffering related to drug overdose. And so given our history and our current opioid epidemic, what is the state of addiction treatment today? Well, first and foremost, the patient with addiction faces tremendous stigma from friends, family, law enforcement, even providers, really all of society. Many still think of addiction as a choice and moral failing and treat individuals with addiction accordingly. And so you see that for many patients, there is a sense of shame, uh, of self-stigma that can act also as a barrier to accessing care. Second, our system of care for patients with addiction is broken. Addiction treatment develops separately from general medical care and even separately from mental health care in most places in the United States. As a result, Around the country, you have a patchwork of addiction treatment facilities that are mostly inpatient and crisis-focused. Very few have a robust community-based network of care. And really, when we talk about addiction and most chronic disease, community care is the standard of care. Third, despite the overwhelming evidence that medication-assisted treatment saves lives, only a fraction of patients, as little as 10% nationally, with opioid use disorder actually receive this life-saving treatment. Part of this is access in the community. Part of this has to do with our insurance coverage and payment policies. And the last piece of this has to do with a lot of the folks who are you know, listening to this lecture. It has to do with providers. We absolutely need more providers to provide this life-saving treatment. Fourth, punitive policies from law enforcement and even from uh, folks uh, in the addiction provider community often prevent individuals from accessing care. By criminalizing addiction and harm reduction, including clean syringes and needles, law enforcement practices often result in harm to individuals with opioid use disorder and certainly add to the stigma around treatment. In the medical community, many practices have very strict policies around attendance, counseling, and even abstinence that make it difficult for patients to achieve recovery over the long term. Recognizing the unique challenges faced by patients and providers in 2017, Virginia Medicaid led a transformation of its addiction treatment system called ARTS, Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services. It aimed to achieve a system that was trauma-informed, person-centered, and recovery-oriented, a system where every door was the right door. And that means meeting patients where they are through engagement with peer recovery specialists, expanding access to high-quality medication-assisted treatment, and particularly in the outpatient setting, uh, but also in addiction treatment facilities and acute care settings, emergency departments, general medical wards. This is really the future of addiction treatment. We have a lot more work to do. 
but by extending coverage of addiction treatment to cover the full spectrum of care shown here in this slide, by increasing reimbursement rates for high quality care, including care coordination, psychosocial treatment services, and peer recovery, and by expanding Medicaid to almost half a million more Virginians, and most recently, removing the prior authorization and limits on pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder, we as a state have made substantial strides towards building uh, uh, and a better addiction, addiction care system where patients can get the treatment that they really need. And so what are the elements of effective treatment? Very simply, they include a comprehensive assessment of the patient, triaging and treatment planning, pharmacotherapy, depending on the type of substance use disorder, and psychosocial treatment. First and foremost, the assessment of the patient should be comprehensive and recognize and honor the bio, psycho, social, and spiritual aspects of care. The American Society of Addiction Medicine lists the six key components of a multi-dimensional assessment. Dimension one um, is focusing on acute intoxication and or withdrawal potential. So this is exploring an individual's past and current experiences of substance use and withdrawal. Dimension two is taking a look at the biomedical conditions and complications, exploring an individual's health history and current physical condition. For folks with substance use disorders, and particularly for those who have injected drugs uh, in the past, this means paying close attention to infectious diseases like hepatitis, uh, B and C, HIV, tuberculosis, looking at acute trauma, and for women, um, uh, testing and understanding whether they are pregnant and or interested in reproductive health services. And of course, a very thorough physical exam. Lab testing should, include, should really cover some of these uh, and look for some of these same conditions. Uh, a, complete, a complete blood count, liver function test, um, uh, test for hepatitis B, C, test for HIV, test for TB, and sexually transmitted infection should also be considered. And then, of course, for women, uh, they should be tested for a pregnancy. The third dimension focuses really on the emotional, behavioral, or cognitive conditions and complications, exploring an individual's thoughts, emotions, and mental health issues. Behavioral health issues, mental health issues, uh, are very frequently um, uh, comorbid with addiction. And so um, anybody with substance use disorder should also have a complete assessment of mental health status and be screened for possible psychiatric disorders. Finally, it's important to recognize that opioid use disorder and, uh, is often co-occurring with other substances, whether that's alcohol, cocaine, and so there should be a really a, a, a comprehensive uh, history around past and current substance use, uh, as well as a determination of the um, the totality of substances that surround the addiction. The fourth dimension is readiness to change. Really understanding where patients are in terms of their, uh, their readiness and their interest in accessing care. And I think the important point to mention is that, and maybe the obvious point really, is that not all patients will be ready for care when you meet them. And so this is why it's important to continue to engage patients um, and where someone like a peer recovery specialist can be very important. The fifth dimension, relapse, continued use, or continued problem potential. This is really about uh, assessing people, places, and things, looking at the social and environmental factors that could um, hamper um, recovery um, or you know, really contribute to relapse in the future. And so you know, it's important to explore this with the patient and work with them hand in hand to identify those factors and create a plan to address them. And then finally, uh, but relatedly, is dimension six, which is recovery and living environment. We know that if patients don't have a stable living condition, it's near impossible for them to reach long-term recovery. And so this is something we must be attuned to. Here, I wanted to talk a little bit about treatment planning. Um, as you can see in the slide, treatment planning um, really has a number of steps, some of which uh, uh, you know, that, that tie directly with a comprehensive assessment. So if you have a full assessment, the, the treatment planning should in some ways be quite straightforward. The first most important thing is to determine the right level of care, the right treatment setting for the patient. 
And really, this is a conversation. Um, it should involve shared decision making, whether they could be in the outpatient setting uh, or they should be in an inpatient setting, whether they should have more or less of a given therapy. The second thing, uh, but also related, is to look at withdrawal. What are the potential risks um, depending on the substances that a patient is using? What's their clinical stability? What are their current symptoms? Um, and is this, you know, for someone who uh, is using multiple substances, do, uh, do they uh, need to um, uh, be monitored for safe withdrawal? Or is this something that can be done in the outpatient setting? The third area, and um, one of the, the most important areas, is really looking at maintenance pharmacotherapy. Um, pharmacotherapy exists for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder and is being explored for many other substances. But if this is an option, this has to be considered and is really the standard of care. And uh, Dr. LeMay will talk more about this shortly. The next is psychosocial supports. And by this, we really mean um, the, the spectrum of psychosocial services. And we'll discuss this in more detail. Um, the next is relapse prevention plan. It's important to monitor objective outcomes, set clear expectations, and make sure that patients have access to high quality medical and psychiatric care. Uh, because you know, really the patient uh, requires a, a comprehensive approach to care, um, not just for their addiction, but also for their other conditions. And so in the next slide, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about pharmacotherapy. And so, as I mentioned before, pharmacotherapy is available for alcohol and opioid use disorders. And again, the maintenance on these medications is the standard of care, the standard of care. Um, the second thing to know is that shared decision-making is really important. People are not always ready to engage in treatment, but they should know the options, and they should know that pharmacotherapy is really the standard. Maintenance pharmacotherapy should be prescribed based on the patient's individual needs without arbitrary tapering or time limits. And I think the, the best um, uh, you know, and, and most up-to-date uh, payer policies really reflect this is that you know, there's no such thing as um, making an arbitrary time limit and saying that someone should only be on pharmacotherapy for six months and then they're cured. It doesn't work like that. Everybody has um, different needs. Um, a different history, and we'll have a different response to pharmacotherapy, and that needs to be taken into consideration. For opioid use disorder, pharmacotherapy can reduce the risk of death by as high as 60%. And so at the end of the day, what leads to that reduction in mortality is adherence. Adherence to, um, to the pharmacotherapy really leads to, um, uh, is the thing that matters most. And so if someone's adherent, uh, to their buprenorphine, their methadone, uh, their naltrexone, they will do better than someone who is not. Um, the next thing to note about, about the specific medication is that, particularly for the opioid agonist therapies, buprenorphine and methadone, um, sometimes it's necessary to um, increase the dose, um, especially for people with comorbid chronic pain uh, and people uh, who uh, inject uh, opioids. Um, uh, multiple studies have shown that higher doses, particularly for these populations, uh, can lead to better outcomes over the long run. What we find in practice, though, is that uh, providers tend to underdose, and this is really um, uh, making these therapies less effective. The last thing uh, to sort of point to make about pharmacotherapy is it's important um, that you know, once you prescribe pharmacotherapy, you also need to make sure that insurance covers it and that the pharmacy is willing to dispense it. In the next slide, I just want to show you all that pharmacotherapy absolutely saves lives. And I think the state of Rhode Island is a particularly compelling example. In 2016, they implemented medication-assisted treatment for all inmates in their correctional facilities, prisons and jails. This is methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. In just a year's time, they witnessed a 60% decline in mortality and death among those recently released from a correctional facility and a 12% decline in statewide mortality. Now this is remarkable. In most states, and even in Rhode Island uh, and uh, the region of the country that Rhode Island is, is in, they're seeing year-over-year increases in overdose deaths. So not only um, 
did they see a leveling off of, of mortality. They actually saw a decline at the state level by implementing pharmacotherapy. And so implementing pharmacotherapy throughout um, uh, the continuum of care, including in correctional facilities, um, is extremely important. The last thing I just wanted to mention is that, um, and one thing you'll notice is that when patients were asked which of the three FDA-approved medications they wanted, buprenorphine, methadone, or naltrexone, most of them chose methadone or um, suboxone in this case, which is the, um, uh, the name, the brand name for buprenorphine and naloxone. Most of the very few uh, chose Vivitrol, which is extended release naltrexone. And the reason I bring this up, um, and the reason it's important, is that really we should be um, having um, a conversation with patients about the type of medication that they want that works best for them. Because if you give them the option, uh, they might choose something different uh, than uh, if you only have one type of medication. Um, so I just wanted to make that a very important point. This next slide, we'll talk about, next two slides, we'll talk about the myths around medication-assisted treatment. The first, and we've talked briefly about this before, is that MAT is only for the short term. Research shows that patients on MAT for at least one to two years have the greatest rates of long-term success. There's no evidence to support benefit from stopping MAT. No evidence to support benefit from stopping MAT. I said that twice because it's extremely important that we don't set arbitrary limits on how long patients should stay on MAT. We should really individualize it. Some people will need to be on longer than one or two years, and that's okay. As long as they're doing well, uh, as long as they're benefiting from therapy and not doing worse, then it makes sense to continue them on, um, on MAT. The second myth is that MAT trades one addiction for another. I hear this a lot, and I hear it from patients, I hear it from providers, and I hear it from folks in the community. But it's important to know that there's a difference between dependence and addiction, and you heard about this in the prior modules. You can be, uh, with MAT, yes, you might experience withdrawal from uh, buprenorphine or methadone if you stop it. And so there is some physiological dependence on the medication. But study after study has shown that those on methadone, on buprenorphine, on Vivitrol, which is extended release naltrexone, that they do well from a mortality perspective, from a morbidity perspective, from a social and economic perspective. They are able to really put their lives back together. And that is, if anything, that's the opposite of addiction. So these medications really work. Um, and I think it's important to realize that. And it's uh, recovery, particularly for opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder, starts with medication uh, and starts with psychosocial treatment. The next myth is that my patient's condition is not severe enough to require MAT. MAT can be tailored to fit the unique needs of the patient. And so if someone is abusing uh, and addicted to prescription opioids, they can benefit from MAT as much as someone who's injecting heroin. That's very important to recognize. In the next slide, uh, here are a couple more myths that I think it's important to understand. There's a myth, uh, and this is a myth, that MAT increases the risk of overdose in patients. This could not be farther from the truth. MAT reduces the risk of death as you saw from the example in Rhode Island and many other studies, by as much as 60%, and actually, in some cases, even higher than that. And so this is, the, uh, this is a complete myth, and so I just wanted to highlight that. The next thing is that some feel that providing MAT will only disrupt and hinder a patient's recovery process. MAT has been shown to assist patients in recovery by improving their quality of life, level of functioning, and ability to handle stress. And above all, MAT reduces mortality while a patient is going through their journey of recovery. They might relapse, but really MAT is a lifeline for them and a foundation upon which they can really start on the, on the road to recovery. The last myth I'll talk about is there isn't any proof that MAT is better than abstinence. Reams of data 
and um, randomized controlled trials um, have demonstrated the superiority of MAT to abstinence. And in some cases, abstinence can inadvertently lead to harm. So for example, uh, in inpatient facilities um, or even in correctional facilities, if someone is, uh, goes through detoxification, withdrawal, they lose their tolerance to an opioid. We know that this is a very high risk, dangerous time when they go back to the community to live their normal lives. And they're at very high risk of overdose because they lost their tolerance. And we know the rates of relapse um, approach 80, 90% among folks who have been uh, gone through detoxification. And so they're at risk for overdose and for death. In this slide, we're talking about psychosocial treatments. And there are a couple of po important points to remember. The, really the purpose of psychosocial treatment is to modify the underlying processes that maintain or reinforce use behavior, to encourage engagement with pharmacotherapy, and to treat any uh, coexisting psychiatric disorders uh, that may complicate a substance use disorder or um, work as a trigger for relapse. Psychosocial treatment really in, refers to a range of therapies, ranging from cognitive behavioral therapy to contingency management to a community reinforcement approach. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of psychotherapy that aims to identify, evaluate, and reorient negative and potentially harmful thoughts. Contingency management is an approach where patients receive money or other types of financial rewards contingent upon abstinence from substances. And community reinforcement approach is a comprehensive intervention which includes functional analysis, skills training, family therapy, and recreational and vocational reinforcements. These interventions are effective across a wide variety of substance use disorders, including for folks with cocaine and amphetamine use disorder. Pharmacotherapy and psychosocial treatment is, the, is really um, the best care that individuals can receive with alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder, and is referred to as medication-assisted treatment. And I'll repeat that one more time, because we use medication-assisted treatment uh, a lot. Really what that refers to is the combination of pharmacotherapy with psychosocial treatment. The last uh, sort of component of psychosocial treatment is, um, uh, or it can be confused for psychosocial treatment, I'll say is mutual health. So this um, is important uh, and this might, uh, you know, uh, could really assist patients uh, in their recovery. And by mutual health groups, I mean Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, um, but it's, it's not uh, classically defined as psychosocial treatment. The one important thing to note about mutual help groups is uh, many are abstinence-based and maybe less inviting to patients with pharmacotherapy. One last important point I wanna make about psychosocial treatment is that one, it's a critical component of comprehensive high quality care and should be offered whenever possible. But pharmacotherapy by itself reduces mortality and so psychosocial treatment should be offered as frequently as possible and continuously throughout treatment, but it should not be required as a condition of receiving pharmacotherapy. In the next session, my colleague, Dr. LeMay, will talk uh, about the final points of medication-assisted treatment.